Hello everyone, my name is Lee Raithby of Results Canada and Stop TB Canada Network. Welcome to today's webinar, Unfinished Business, TB, HIV, and COVID-19 in our communities. I would like to start by paying respect to the Algonquin people, who are the traditional guardians of the land where the Office of Results Canada is located in Ottawa. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory today. I would also like to pay respect to the hundreds of children whose bodies were recently found on the grounds of Canadian residential schools. Early evidence indicates that many of these children had TB, which is indicative of the poor living conditions and abuse that these children were subjected to. I would like to share a recently published piece by Stop TB Canada Steering Committee members that underlines the nature of TB as a disease of inequity, strongly linked to social determinants of health, such as overcrowding and malnutrition, that were the result of the neglect and abuse inherent to residential schools. As we explore today's topics, let us remember that, as emphasized in this article, as long as we allow TB to disproportionately persist among Indigenous communities, we are failing to provide the most basic level of justice to these people, let alone reconciliation. Today's discussion will focus on how the global TB and HIV epidemics fuel each other, with TB remaining the leading cause of death among people living with HIV, and with less than half of TB cases among people living with HIV being diagnosed and treated appropriately. Despite the many intersections on social determinants of health and TB and HIV often disproportionately affecting the same communities, TB and HIV work still largely operates in silos. We believe this is a huge missed opportunity. This is why last year, Results Canada and ICAD came together to join forces through the development of two resources focusing on the collaborative TB and HIV response. We will be sharing these resources with this group where you can learn more about key policy and programming considerations for the Canadian response to TB and HIV and how to implement the UN declaration on TB that came out of the UN high level meeting on TB in 2018. Today's webinar will also touch on the UN high-level meeting on AIDS that happened last month. The political declaration on AIDS that resulted from this meeting included a few TB commitments that reinforced the interconnected nature of these two diseases. Some of these TB-related commitments included increasing financing for research and development of new tools for TB prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, ensuring that 90% of people living with HIV receive preventive treatment for TB by 2025, and reducing TB-related deaths among people living with HIV by 80% by 2025. Today's webinar will involve an informative panel discussion with industry experts, followed by an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Our hope is that through continued collaboration and partnership, we can break down the silos that TB and HIV communities are currently working within and increase the impact we have towards ending both of these epidemics together. Now is the time to join forces as the COVID-19 pandemic challenges our communities even more in how we address the needs of people living with and at risk of TB and HIV. We hope to identify these challenges as well as the opportunities that exist for the TB and HIV communities. Please keep your mics muted and use the chat to ask questions or share comments throughout the panel discussion. There will also be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to unmute and ask your questions directly to the panelists. I will now pass it over to Sugandi, who will introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion. Can't. We recently redesigned our website, can.ca, and I encourage everyone to visit us there to learn more about our work. I have the privilege today of being the moderator for an excellent trio of panelists. After I introduce them, I will ask each of them different questions and there will be two questions at the end that all three of them answer. And like Lee mentioned, if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat bar and mention if it's a question for one specific person or for all three. After I've asked the panelists my list of questions, I will go through the chat history to ask them any questions that have been put there. And if there's time, we will open up the floor for questions. 
As your humble moderator, one of my roles is to make sure that we stay on track for time. I'm going to do my best to make sure that we get through as many of the questions in the chat as possible, but in the interest of time, I may have to be selective. I will prioritize questions of clarification and questions that haven't already been answered by the panelists in their other responses. Okay, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our three panelists. Aiga Sangwea currently sits on the board of the Ile Saksavik Society and serves as the community health representative of Clyde River, Nunavut. In the past, sorry, in the past, Aiga has also served on the board of directors of Paututi and Cam. In the short time that I've known Aiga, it's clear that she is quietly brilliant and powerful. Every time she speaks, I learn a lot from the knowledge that she shares. We're very privileged to hear her today. She's also been very kind when helping me with my pronunciation of words in Inuktitut. Kuyanamik, Aiga. As the, oh, sorry. As the ED of the Interagency Coalition on AIDS and Development, ICAD, Robin Montgomery has over 20 years of experience working on HIV and global health in Canadian and international settings. Prior to joining ICAD, Robin's international experience focused on Eastern Europe and Central Asia, EECA. Robin is a board member of the Developed Country NGO Delegation and chair of the Implementer Group of the Board of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. She supports the NGO delegation to the UNAIDS Program Coordinating Board. Robin holds a Master's in Health Administration from the Institute of Health Policy, Management, and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Robin is amazing. She is spatially brilliant and connects complex ideas in a way that feels very natural. We're very lucky to hear Robin speak today. Trevor Stratton is a Two-Spirit citizen of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation near Toronto, Canada. Diagnosed with HIV in 1990, he is the coordinator of the International Indigenous Working Group on HIV AIDS, IGWA, for its host organization, CAN, now known as Communities, Alliances, and Networks. I've known Trevor for over 10 years and through at least eight different hairstyles. His activism and advocacy is awe-inspiring, and his energy reminds us of why we do this work. We're incredibly lucky to hear him share his wisdom today. Welcome, Aiga, Robin, and Trevor. Okay, let's get into it. First question is for Robin. Last year, your organization, ICAD, partnered with Results Canada to launch two resources about TV, TB and HIV. What led to this collaboration and how do you think people working in HIV and TB can collaborate going forward? Thanks so much, Sugandhi. And I'm just going to do a sound check. Can, it, can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, hello, everybody. Um, really amazing to be with you all today uh, in this discussion. And it's amazing to be amongst a panelist of greats. So thank you so much for having me. And I too would like just to recognize and pay tribute to the territory in which I find myself um, and the Secretariat of ICAD is located on the territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nations and just would like to pay great thanks and tribute to uh, the keepers of this land known as Turtle Island. So thank you very much for having me here today. So I guess just in short, um, in response to your question, Sugandhi, uh, Results Canada and ICAD have had a long partnership um, working together, bringing together the world of TB and the world of HIV into Canadian policy dialogues. We do a lot of advocacy work to raise Canada's awareness and government officials' awareness of the importance of TB and HIV worldwide in terms of Canada's response globally, but also in terms of the incredible rates of TB and of HIV here in Canada, particularly nestled amongst our most vulnerable, hard to reach and mar marginalized populations. So when we're looking at who we're talking about in the Canadian population, as all of us very well know here on today's um, discussion, we're talking about newcomer and refugee populations, and we're talking Unfortunately, about Indigenous communities, which have borne the brunt of all of our epidemics here in Canada, including HIV and TB. And so over our long history of partnership between Results Canada and ICAD, 
um, we have used different international moments to be able to really um, catapult forward our work in Canada around TB and HIV. And the most recent example of that is the last UN high level meeting on TB, which I believe was in 2019, 2018. And so in lead up to this, with the, the support of the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, ICAD in partnership with results and the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, otherwise known as CAN, we led a policy dialogue um, with TB experts and HIV experts with, from all sectors. So we had policymakers, we had research academics, we had frontline public health uh, workers, we had people with lived experiences, we had frontline service organizations, non-governmental organizations working from across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. And we brought everybody together, as well as international colleagues using a, a mixed blend, which is now what we do every day, um, where we brought people in using virtual technology um, and had lots of people in the room. And together what we did is in advance of the meeting, we did a number of webinars where we introduced specific themes and issues of significance, particularly to Canada, as it related to TB, and TBHIV. When we all got together, that was the moment just following the UN high, uh, high level declaration uh, or UN meeting, a high level meeting on, on TB, where we were able to dissect and, and deconstruct the declaration that had been endorsed by all member states and take a look at what we were going to be asking for from the Canadian government. So we did a lot of lobbying in advance together uh, to the Canadian government to help inform their positions at that high level meeting. But then also really importantly, we had that meeting to talk about what kind of accountability framework did we want to have and how were we going to apply it to the Canadian context. And so together with all of those multidisciplinary partners from across sectors, we were able to come up with an accountability framework, which I will post just shortly in our chat box so everyone can have a look at that. So again, you know, uh, unfortunately TB is not getting the recognition it requires, not here in Canada, not globally. Um, right now we are having extensive discussions within the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria about how we allocate resources more equitably, understanding that TB is the world's leading killer. Um, it has been surpassed now by COVID, unfortunately. Um, but TB has surpassed HIV. And TB is curable. So what are we going to do about this? Because it's unacceptable to let it continue. Uh, so that's a little bit about our history and happy to share more um, during the questions and answers. Thanks, Ugandi. Excellent. Thank you, Robin. Aiga, my next question is for you. What do you want people to know about HIV and TB in your community? How will bringing HIV and TB work together benefit both illnesses? Okay. Welcome and thank you. I am honored to be invited to this very important panel. All of the participants. As we are, as Inuit, have come a long way concerning HIV and TB. We all know. And as we have been focusing on COVID-19 for the last two years, and has put this HIV, TB, on, and other diseases in the back burner. Here we have to go back on track, educating people on HIV, TB. I said, the Inuit community have come a long way. We are still on the educating part have to translate literature in, in, to Inuktitut, turning these topics, let alone into our own dialects. Each community has 
own dialects, each community. We have 25 communities in Nunavut. I'll, I'll give you a brief history. Um, what Tibi has been tra translated to is Puwadlungnak, meaning bad lungs. This is the history when Tibi came to Inuit communities because TB, TB was mainly in the lungs in Inuit. The word has stuck to our language, Puwadlungnak, bad lungs. To this day, we all know that TB can be in the lungs, kidneys, brain, and wherever. HIV history as Inuit, new person with HIV was visiting a lot of communities in the 1980s, and it impacted all the communities. Uh, although there was a lot of stigma back then, a lot a lot of people were impacted. Her name was Litia Jita. Find her in the literature in the 1980s. She was standing, and she was a patient that we needed that we didn't know didn't know about. We have learned a lot from COVID-19 for the last two years. Because of precautions like masks and washing, etc., a lot of viruses like the flu, RSV, etc., eased in numbers. So thank you, COVID-19. We have learned a lot, a whole lot from you. But let's get back on track. Let, nice. let us get back. Go back to. Yeah, I remember I go when you and when you and I talked talked and uh, let's get back on track with something that you had said often. So thank you for sharing that. My next question is for Trevor. How are things like stigma and other social barriers making it harder to respond to HIV and TB? Hmm. Well, first, let me acknowledge the land that I'm on um, in the dish with one spoon territory. It's a shared territory between my nation, Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nation, and uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Anishinaabe. The dish with one spoon is a, we, we share this territory and it was, a, it was a peace treaty and it covers the land from the greater Toronto area and Hamilton throughout the, the Niagara region, um, pretty much in the Ontario region. And yes, I've experienced a lot of stigma related to HIV, but you know, in my, in my work, um, I work with people living with HIV and TB and I also hear it from, from them. So it's not, it's, it, you know, stigma is not only about HIV, it's, it's also about TB, particularly for Indigenous peoples. But I have uh, uh, some information to share with you about stigma and discrimination in workplaces around the world. We know HIV and TB, you know, thrives where populations are, have lowered uh, social and structural determinants of health. We've come to talk about them as key affected populations. It's many, that means that many people already who are marginalized are, are likely experiencing discrimination long before their diagnosis of TB or HIV. But you know, if, if when people see that other people living with TB or HIV are being stigmatized or discriminated against, it's less likely that they're gonna go get testing or, or go on treatment or, or be able to adhere to their, their meds, right? Especially if they're constantly in fear that their condition is gonna be discovered or exposed. Maintaining that confidentiality of uh, the, the TB or HIV status is a big barrier as well. But in, in December of 2019, the International Labor Organization, one of the UN agencies, they collaborated with CAN and IGWA to undertake a qualitative study called Stigma and Discrimination Experienced by Indigenous Peoples Living with HIV or Having TB in the Workplace. The report showed that um, Indigenous peoples face double discrimination, like I say, because they're Indigenous as well as living with TB or, or, or HIV. Yeah, and we found that being an LGBTQ Indigenous person adds yet another layer to this. And of course, there are so many layers. 
and barriers to accessing health services and uh, like the denial of the right to work and discrimination in, in employment settings. These are some of the highlights that uh, we found when we did our, um, our study. Indigenous people living with HIV or TB reported losing their jobs, losing promotions, leaving the workforce for fear of disclosure or not being hired because of their status, being harassed and discriminated against by employers and coworkers. Recommendations um, uh, included involving people with living experiences, right? And nothing about us without us and reviewing disclosure and confidentiality policies and workplace protections, providing information and education in the languages of indigenous communities, training service providers about stigma and discrimination, respecting confidentiality and indigenous cultures and, and designing campaigns against stigma and discrimination. Engaging and enforcing legal solutions was recommended. It's one thing to have, a, have something on the books, but it's a whole other thing and whether the, these, these are being enforced. We need improved mechanisms to support legal claims against discrimination and implementing and enforcing legal mechanisms for redress. Um, responding to stigma and discrimination in the workplace is really important and can include targeting the employers directly and co-workers and Indigenous people with lived experience in the development and execution of the interventions. Bring them all in and have them invent their own ways of addressing it. Employers and employees should be engaged in, in the training about uh, the country-specific legislation and policy. Like, can people actually name the legislation in their countries that uh, that, that, that um, you know, proscribes the stigma and discrimination. And of course, more research and interventions. I'm sure there's a lot of researchers and academics that would agree with me, but let me leave you with a quote. I know that health professionals due to ignorance of the native people's culture have discriminated in the sense that they think indigenous peoples don't follow the treatment correctly because they have the opinion that the culture is messy. It's irresponsible. And they've told this directly to a man that he will not be able to go ahead with the treatment because he is irresponsible. And this was from a participant from Latin America who is employed in the formal sector. Thanks, Ugandi. That's what I have for that. Thank you, Trevor. I go back to you. How has COVID-19 impacted stigma? Are there other barriers preventing an effective response to HIV and TB in Northern communities? Again, COVID-19 has helped a lot in the barriers. I've had personal experience with stigma as I had active TB about four years ago. I'll give you a bit history on it again. In the 1950s, 60s, and to the 70s, my people used to go down south, meaning sanatoriums for two, three, four years without community communicating with family members, and some who went down as children lost their mother tongue and didn't remember their parents or culture or by the time they came back. It, re it, was, it is very similar to those who went to residential school. Now, nowadays, when I had my TB, I was sent down to Ekhalid, which is in my uh, territory went to the hospital, which is in Nunavut, and in the hospital I was uh, isolating for two weeks. Then I resumed my treatment at home, which is, oh, about 100% better than being sent down south for years. Stigma was also visible in my days, about three years ago, because I was, in, uh, I was working in the health field um, because the community is small and word goes around very quickly. Though there's shells there around. As I said earlier, COVID-19 has helped in a way such as distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene, etc. But again, use the pandemic as a tool to reinforce these barriers and get back on track, forcing on other viruses and sickness. And so my goal is to educate and the enemy. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Aiga. Robin, what challenges has COVID-19 presented in the fight against TB and HIV? Thanks, Sugandhi, and, and thanks, Aiga. I think, Aiga, you've named it, you've put the nail right on the head. Um, I guess one thing I would say from an international perspective, but also really resonates with the Canadian situation is that, you know, whether it is political or economic or climate related, natural disaster, conflict or health related, we know and we see every day that crises are really difficult and that they expose the deepest of our world's inequities, most particularly for the poorest, most marginalized and vulnerable groups, the hardest to reach um, for various reasons, right? It might be because of geographic location. It might be a, a whole myriad of, of other things that are, are also related to the determinants of health. But I think, you know, from an international perspective, and again, one that resonates here in Canada, is that there are lots of intersections that we see with people who are most at risk of TB and people most at risk of COVID because it's the most marginal with the least ability to pay and the least ability to seek care who are at the greatest risk. Um, what we are also seeing, I guess there are two or three other trends that I, I'd like to just quickly raise here in, in, in response to this question, Sugandhi. The first one, or the second one rather, is the diversion of resources. And so this is something um, that we haven't been able to track so well here in Canada, although I'd love to hear from the wisdom of everyone here on our call today, but that we have been seeing internationally. And that's the diversion of resources away from TB programs and efforts in terms of human resource efforts, um, financial resources being diverted from TB programs to now COVID-19 responses, and especially technical um, resources um, away from TB towards COVID-19 uh, responses. And of course, these are all supposed to be temporary, but we know that the tale of COVID is going to be very long and it is going to be very strong, particularly hitting, again, the most marginal and the most vulnerable um, communities around the world. Um, so when we're talking about technical, for example, we're seeing the use of gene expert machines um, being diverted from rural areas where TB programs exist around the world and taken to COVID safe um, uh, centers in urban settings, which means that there is a, a huge reduction in the ability of countries and particularly local communities in being able to find TB missing cases or being able to ensure that those who feel they are at risk of TB are able to get the care that they need in a timely fashion so that they don't have to take necessarily those difficult drug treatments um, because of the accelerated rate of their disease or because of antimicrobial resistance. Um, what we also have seen is as a result of COVID-19 around the world, the travel restrictions, the lockdowns, and the, um, uh, the, the stay-at-home regulations not only have increased in what is particularly important when we're talking about HIV, but also TB, and we don't often think about it in, in the world of TB, but gender-based violence and the lack of access for the most at risk of TB and those living with TB to continued services and to continued care, not only because of the travel restrictions or the shutdowns, right, or the lockdowns, which means that it's really difficult to access treatments um, as necessary, or to get away from your household, or it's going to increase your costs for getting to a, a, from point A to point B, but also in terms of um, the digital divide. And so this is the, the third part. And this is what we are seeing in particular here in Canada, but also in other high income countries where services have been taken online, right? 
um, and who has access to online technologies, who has access to smartphones, who are able to be and, and engage with those apps that are now being used that are, are really high functioning. Um, and so what COVID has really emphasized, I mean, there are lots of things that it's emphasized, um, but is really the disparities and the growing disparities and the new types of disparities, whether it's income disparity because jobs are not easily moved to the home, um, but it has really accentuated the disparities between communities in Canada. It's also really accentuated the feminization of, of these diseases being both TB and of HIV. The feminization because it is often, and as we've seen here with Canadian research that's coming out daily, it's the women who really bear the brunt um, in terms of caring and caregiving for sick and loved ones, caregiving for kids who are out of school and who are also um, juggling and trying to make ends meet with multiple um, jobs often. The final thing that I would say before handing it back to you, Sagandi, and it's just a quick one, is that what we've often talked about in, H in the world of HIV and TB is the siloed care systems, right? When we're looking at health systems, we often see HIV here, TB here, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections over here. And what TB and HIV experts have been trying to do for decades is bring us together and to integrate us across so that we're working together and we see the person as a whole person. What COVID has accentuated are these vertical systems because in fact, COVID has become another vertical system. And so what we're really trying to do together as a partnership here um, with everyone here, but also with the organizers and co-hosts of this, this discussion, and with our international partners is to really make sure when we are moving forward on a COVID TB related agenda, that we are making sure that it is, it is integrated and it is not an extra layer or verticalization of healthcare that one person has to try to navigate. Thanks. Amazing. There was so much hot knowledge in there, Robin. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ugandi. The next question is for Trevor. At the recent high-level meeting on AIDS, a political declaration came out that includes some TB-related commitments from member states. Tell us more about this and the value of TB targets along with these commitments. Oh, so Gandhi, that was so stressful, the high-level meeting, I was trying to forget it. Now here you are bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, you know, yeah. Like in 2016 was the last, uh, um, High level meeting on ending AIDS at the UN. This I was involved then, and this year I was involved again with the Civil Society Advisory Committee and the and the multi stakeholder task force that feed into the HLM, the high level meeting on AIDS. Except for the permanent missions uh, of the UN in New York of the member states, the delegations participated virtually. So that was really new. This was a barrier in itself, you know, especially when you consider all of the missed opportunities to speak directly with member, you know, with people on the different delegations between the formal sessions in the hallways, in the lobbies, in the cafeterias, maybe over a couple of drinks and they loosen up over lunch or something. This is where a lot of the serious lobbying really can take place and often does. And, and civil society advocates and lobbyists would normally be meeting with member states to discuss all these issues, specific wording and, and to enhance the targets contained in the, in the HLM. The outcome document is known as the political declaration that comes out of the HLM. So there's all this people come shopping around and saying, this is what the language we're, we're trying to get uh, put in there. C can you help us get it in? And they'd say, well, this, yes, this, no, can you change this? And it's all this horse trading that goes back and forth. But once, once it's finalized, the political declaration, declaration, member states are expected to adapt the targets and strategies from the PD, political declaration, to develop their own national aid strategies um, over, the next, over the following five years. The struggle for the inclusion of progressive targets in the PD is essential because if there's not targets and metrics for a particular issue like uh, SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights, for example, it's not going to be measured when they, when they meet every couple of years to, to find out how we're doing. Of course, some countries go far beyond the targets contained in the PD, but some 
and more conservative countries fight to exclude the types of targets that don't fit into their sometimes philosophical, moral, and legal approaches to the HIV and TV response. And this is where the criminalization of LGBTQ, sex work, drug use, and trans identities, or the criminalization of HIV non-disclosure can be justified unless there's strong language in the PDs to support community-based responses. And this is important also for TB. Because like Robin said, you know, TB is the leading cause of death for people living with HIV and, um, um, you know, less, less than half of TB cases among people living with HIV are diagnosed and treated properly around the world. Despite this, we're, we, we're, we desperately need to develop new tools for TB prevention and diagnosis and treatment, including for multi-drug resistant TB for people living with HIV, and especially in the current context of, of COVID-19. The world's committed to end HIV and HIV AIDS and TB by 2030. And the UN political declaration to end AIDS uh, has very important and ambitious, ambitious targets, but a lot of activists, academics, and responders think that it's not gonna be enough. The first draft of the political declaration when it first came out, when we were all so, it was so inspirational and we were so excited, but after each round of the United Nations member state negotiations, all this horse trading, the targets get watered down further and further. The final uh, PD language was weakened on sexual and reproductive health and rights, not surprisingly, comprehensive sexuality education, harm reduction, sexual orientation, gender identity, community leadership, decriminalization, repealing punitive laws, and TRIPS waivers, as uh, you may know as trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, which keeps the, the prices of our, of our drugs for HIV and TB um, quite high. Um, we have to have more investment in participation and capacity and leadership of the key vulnerable populations, which are, some of them are the same, but some are very different for TB and HIV. And uh, you know, more investment in commitments to identify, monitor, and remove these barriers uh, related to human rights and, and gender that hinder the, and prevent access to health and social services. We need uh, you know, strong community in, engagement, especially from those with lived experience of TB to push decision makers and elected officials to show the political will to take the steps that are, are gonna stop TB and end AIDS. Understanding the value of, of community Stop, the, the Stop TB, who's uh, hosting this webinar, they, we, we, because we, I'm on the committee too, we recently launched a, a group for TB survivors, those living with TB or family members of those uh, affected by TB to share their experiences and, and post resources and support each other. The group's quite new, but um, as of right now, we have a Facebook group that we would welcome any interested audience members to join. Maybe our webinar moderators, uh, moderators would be kind enough to share the link in the chat and you can, you know, just uh, let them know you're interested and uh, they'll, uh, you know, review your, you and, uh, and, and invite you into to be part of a closed group. And we hope to continue this network and form a community of people with lived experiences who can share their voice in the, in the fight to end TB. Let's face it, it's a, it's a national embarrassment in Canada that we have such high prevalence in certain key populations in a low prevalence, high income country. Indigenous peoples, especially our Inuit populations and newcomers to Canada from countries with high TB incidence, they're experiencing high rates of, of prevalence rates for HIV. It's, it's an embarrassing for me um, to work internationally and to, to have to uh, you know, speak to this issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Robin. Following up on, so Robin, this is the final question before I pose a question to all the panelists. Uh, Robin, following up on, so conversely to what uh, Trevor had been talking about, following up on TB related targets, how are AIDS related targets critical to ending TB? Thanks. You know, these I, nice light questions that I have yeah, for you guys. Nice question. <laughs> Um, but I think that is uh, one of the critical questions, absolutely. Um, and so to this, I would just kind of reiterate what we've already heard today from Aiga and what we've heard from Trevor. Um, we need to take a holistic approach, right? Um, following up on TB related targets and how do AIDS related targets uh, relate to you know, ending TB? When we're talking about holistic approaches, we're recognizing that a person is multidimensional and multifaceted. 
How can we treat only one side of an individual when they might have multiple things that are bringing down their immune systems or that they are trying to battle against, whether it's health related or all of those determinants of health that actually have influence on how on health and well-being, right? So we need to take a holistic approach. So anything that is AIDS related, because there is that, I don't know if it's really the slogan that it is right now, but I think we should bring it back because it is a, a it is a, a, an important reminder, I think, that we're talking about, when we're talking about HIV and TB, we're talking about two diseases, one face, right? And so what does that one face require in order to be healthy? Um, and that is the holistic approach that also includes HIV related targets and indicators to make sure that we are really, we're not just treating for the sake of treating, we're treating for health and well being and for a quality of life that is way better than what is they, that the individual might be confronting right now. Um, I guess the only other thing, one little note here that I made for myself is that the AIDS related targets out of the 2021 political declaration on HIV that, that Trevor was just speaking to and also about the, the TB declaration. I think in terms of a Canadian agenda, I think they're really important reminders that will hopefully activate us as a group and our networks to really call on the Canadian government to do more. Honestly, it's really scary because we are not seeing new money for COVID. We are seeing money going from one pocket to the COVID pocket and TB and HIV are suffering because of it. Um, we need as a Canadian community to really move the dial in how we can demonstrate as we have done in many instances before as global champions and ambassadors to show how it can be done. And we have the knowledge, we have the know-how, and most importantly, we have the communities at greatest risk and most affected um, who are able to guide us, to tell us what is right and what is wrong. I'll leave it there, thanks. Excellent, thank you very much, Robin. My final question to all three panelists, I'm going to combine these questions and I'm gonna ask you to be briefish in your response is, so two parts, what opportunities exist for HIV and TB communities within the context of COVID-19? And what are some key messages and calls to action that you want participants to take home from this webinar? Nice and light, that's my <laughs> question style. I don't know who, who might want to go first. I'd, I'd love to hear from Iga. Okay. The high incidence of TB in Inuit communities is lack of housing. Exactly. Can we use COVID-19? Can we use COVID-19 as an example? Because it went rampant. Um, in, uh, especially in Alviet, the first community that hit it. Because it's so, um, there's lack, lack, very lack of housing there that it went rampant when it first came to Nunavut. Can we use that as, as an example? We're talking about TB. Thank you, Aiga. Trevor and or Robin. I can give it a shot if you want, Robin. I have a feeling she's sure. got some overarching comments to make. Um, when, when we were trying to think of people with lived experience for this webinar, I reached out to my friend and fellow activist, Charles Bottle in Thunder Bay, Ontario. He was from Bearskin Lake First Nation, but he grew up in Pickle Lake, known as Mishkigogming First Nation. But, he wasn't responding to any of my Facebook texts. So I, I, I checked with his friends who said that this is probably not the best time because he was going through a hard time. Two days later, I heard that Chucky passed away. 
his friends and family, they gave me permission to mention him during our webinar today. Charles became caught between the collision of several crises in Canada. Five years ago, Charles was diagnosed with TB, HIV, and hepatitis C at the same time. Within two years, Chucky had cleared TB and HCV and achieved an undetectable viral load for HIV. He was a community hero. He showed the way. He became a community champion for harm reduction and substance use. He was known for promoting safer injecting and drug use with his friends for, for, for his work at, at an organization in Thunder Bay called Elevate, but also in his own building where he lived and on the streets where he, he, would, he, he, he knew lots of people. He was known for changing the dynamics around safer injecting. As a result of his efforts, reusing unsterile injecting equipment became really uncool. Chuck was really well liked, but he, he died during the COVID-19 lockdown from the poisoned drug supply in the streets of Canada. Chuck was a gentle soul and a good person and harm reduction works for TB too. We need more of that, more of the starting where people are at and not judging them for the circumstances they're experiencing. So I, wanted, I, I had to mention that. I don't know if I directly talked about COVID-19, but that's the context under which he died. And in terms of calls to action, I'll briefly mention the, the Indigenous people's global call to action for TB, which um, uh, uh, is part of our, we developed a document um, as part of our international work. Um, maybe that hopefully we can share the link in the chat, but in the call to action, we asked for another UN high level meeting on ending TB for 2023. We urge the response uh, must be implemented through a human rights lens. We asked for disaggregated epi data for indigenous peoples. We insisted that indigenous peoples be provided with access to first line medicines and therapies and the elimination of these old and harmful drugs and diagnostics. We asked for the inclusion of indigenous indicators within national targets. And we said that a process is required to engage Indigenous community members to appropriately, appropriately identify restorative actions needed to promote like a, a reconciliation and a constructive uh, community-based treatments and, and responses. So uh, I'll end there. We've been advocating um, globally for that for a long time and I'm not getting very far, but little by little, we'll get there. Thank you, Trevor. That's really, really moving and my condolences. Um, to the entire community. That's ab absolutely tragic. That should not have happened. Absolutely should not have happened. Um, so I guess to tie into what you were saying are some of the key things that um, I see in terms of opportunities for the TB and HIV communities within the context of COVID and also the call to action. So first off, and the TB community is really well aware of this narrative of global health security. We need to reframe that. That is a colonialist ideology that is way deserves to just to, to be put into the back books and into <laughs> cellar somewhere. We need to be talking about global health solidarity, right? When we're talking about global health solidarity, it cuts, it cuts across illnesses and diseases. And it's based on human rights, a human rights framework where communities who are at the greatest risk and living, have lived experience are at the center of the response, are telling us and guiding us and helping to create as active champions and as solution bearers for how to make our systems better. We need to be talking about resilient systems for health, which also includes community systems. So community health workers, but really also um, from where our panelists sit, also com uh, community organizations, uh, civil society groups, um, you know, uh, networks of people with lived experience. All of these partners need to be brought around the table. We really need to invest in the idea of partnership because it can't be just done by one sector or one perspective alone. We really need everybody. And COVID has showed us this. Um, we've seen it before many times with HIV and TB, but it's really been accentuated and highlighted um, and caught the political attention of governments across the world because of COVID. The second thing would be gender equality. 
um, the rights of women and, and uh, women in their fullest diversity, genders in their, in their fullest celebration of life need to be at the center of this because they are on the margins of the margins. Second or thirdly is around innovation. We talk about all of the challenges that we have encountered because of COVID, but there have also been a lot of innovations that wouldn't have happened quite as quickly without the spur of, of COVID. And so I'd, I'd call on us to reflect on these innovations and really advocate that those continue to be funded and advance so that we don't actually lose track of those really valuable learnings. And then the last thing that I'll end on is around um, AIDS 2022. And I'm not sure who on our call is familiar with it, but there, the International AIDS Conference is being hosted by Canada in 2022, so next summer, and it's going to be hosted uh, in Montreal. <clears throat> so it's a massive international moment. And there's always a side symposium or a side conference um, that will be amplified this year, not only because of COVID, but because of the presence of, of TB. And so it's a call on action or call to action of everyone on today's um, discussion is to um, come together and think about what we might wanna do together to really spotlight Canada's innovations, Canada's challenges, but also Canada's opportunities. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our panelists for their awesome amazingness. You guys are so smart. Um, Global Health Solidarity. Yes, absolutely. I'm just looking through the chat. Lyle, what's up? The narrative is very powerful. I agree. It's nice to see you. Um, in scrolling through the chat, I didn't see any particular questions. So we have about five minutes and I will open up the, uh, the floor. If you do have a question, I ask that you raise your hand. So if you look at the bottom of your bar, it'll say reactions, hover over that and you'll see a little raise hand option. Can I ask a question? I suppose, Robin. Thanks. Could I see just a quick show of hands if there's anybody interested in joining us in doing something around AIDS 2022? Just raise up, thumbs up, hands up. Awesome. That's really exciting, folks. Yay. That's really powerful. Thank you. That gives me goosebumps. Oh, we do have a question. Thank you, Petra. How can we join hands to increase the funding for AIDS, TB, and health in general instead of competing? Yes, very good question. Panelists? Who wants to go first? Well, I think... Um, uh, I got oh, go ahead, Iga. Okay. Uh, no, it just came to my mind that do we need a pandemic in order to get what we want action done on uh, TB and HIV? That's a question to government. I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you. So I think in my perspective, it would be, again, looking at how we partner with one another and trying to push out the boundaries of those partnerships, right? If we are wanting things to be less competitive, then we need to be doing these meetings together and doing this advocacy work together. Um, it's, the messages, the voice is louder and stronger when it's together and less fragmented. And I would say that the Stop TB um, Canada Steering Committee is one of the kinds of mechanisms where we, we can do that. And Robin's got lots of experience um, in ICAD with lobbying and advocating directly with um, elected officials or high ranking um, civil servants who are in charge of entire departments and, and, and the other you know, organs and different things. And 
the timing is important too, to be able to hit them when they're beginning to discuss the, the budget at the, at the cabinet level. Yeah. So arm the cabinet ministers with, this is what we want, here's the price tag, and then they go fight for it in the budget against the other ministers. And so that timing is really important and coordination between us, I think is uh, key. Such a great point, Trevor, such a great point. And so just for us to keep in the back of our minds, as we start to roll towards AIDS 2022, Canada is in an election year and there are going to be announcements wanting to be made by the government in terms of different commitments. So it is time to really ramp up our advocacy and our relationships with the different government bodies that are here, whether it's the Public Health Agency of Canada, Global Affairs Canada, um, it's a whole government approach. So we really need to be as uh, expansive as possible um, to start helping to guide the government towards the things that we would hope to see them announce. So we have a moment of opportunity. Excellent. We have uh, two questions. I thought I saw a third hand. So I will go in or Bryn, if you're still around, uh, we'll go Andrea, Bryn, if you're here, and then Renee. So Andrea, please. Oh, sorry. I, I guess my hand stayed up, Sugandi. I was just responding to um, to the question about being involved in 2022 for some kind of TB event. Okay. I, I appreciate the sustained enthusiasm. Oh, <laughs> Renee, too. Okay. Thank you, though. I really yeah, enjoyed no the discussion. Just going to do a quick scan. Yeah, Renee, I see you laughing, too. It is pretty funny. Uh... I thought Lyle's recent comment was pretty important about mm. uh, getting about other levels of government as well. Thanks, Lyle. Good to see you, by the way. Lyle, I think that's an excellent point. And just from the experiences that we've seen around the world, um, local governments have had huge impact, especially around these moments of international gatherings, whether it's a UN high level meeting of some sort or a UN gathering or a replenishment conference or a, a, an international conference. Cities that host, for example, or cities within the host country that are able to demonstrate leadership and advancement actually put out the call to action to other local governments. Um, and so it's, it's really to, sorry of the pun, but it's infectious, right? Um, so it, it really does have a huge impact. I know for the high level meeting on HIV, there was a, a, a big initiative with municipalities around the world around HIV and the city's competition to talk about the innovations that they were doing. And many of them included around harm reduction and marrying that together with TB services. Excellent. Thank you. Before I pass it back to Lee, uh, I just want to say thank you very much to our three brilliant panelists and to thank all the participants. I know you could have been anywhere today and you chose to be here. And we're very grateful. So thank you. And I will pass it back to Lee. Thanks, Sigandi. And thanks, Aiga, Robin, and Trevor for such an impactful discussion and to everyone who joined us today. It's obviously clear that there's a need for the TB and HIV communities to join forces and increase our impact together. So let's vow to not allow COVID-19 to be an excuse to fall back on these other global health issues, but rather advocate for COVID-19 response to include addressing these secondary impacts of the pandemic, such as the impact on TB and HIV work. This partnership um, is one that Results Canada, Stop TB Canada, can and ICAD intend on continuing to grow. And we hope that we hope to move forward with this collaborative work, especially in the lead up to AIDS 2022. So we'll be following up with an email from Stop to Be Canada, which will include all the resources that were mentioned in today's discussion, as well as some ways that you can take action and remain engaged in these efforts. So thank you again to everyone for joining today's webinar and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Megwitch, take care, everybody. Stay safe. 
Tchau.